Okay, it's Dr. Morton doing the uh, lecture for uh, DSD for the 25th. Um, so we will have uh, two lectures next week, and I think what I'm going to do uh, is I'm going to do the one on Monday. I think I'll do live at uh, 9 a.m. on Monday. So um, I assume that a lot of students won't be there for it. I will record it, and then I will post it. Uh, but I'd like to have some students so you can ask questions, which hopefully will help other students trying to prepare for the test. The test is not going to be that big a deal, so what I really want you to do is be working on your final project. I'd much rather you get your final project done and, uh, and only do a little bit of reviewing for the test, and I think you'll be better off if you do that. Um, in any event, uh, you know, I think the test should be pretty straightforward. Oh, so, oh. So, so here we go. So we're going to do a little review. I'm going to go through one of the final exams from before. The final exam will be mo mostly true-false, multiple-choice type questions. Um, I, there may be a few uh, little fragments of code. Uh, I may have an accompanying document where I, um, where I give you some figures or something to use on the test. I don't know. Haven't haven't written the test yet, but I will get that done hopefully maybe over this break. Uh, that's my goal, and. Um, I will finally get all of the practicums graded. I almost have them, or maybe I have them all done now. Um, maybe not. I have a few more to do, I think, but I'll, I'll get those done also. Um, and hopefully, uh, hopefully our grader will get everything caught up and done. Um, you can uh, you can demonstrate your you can go to the lab and demonstrate your product your project tomorrow, and then next week the campus will be closed, so you'll have to submit a video. Uh, if you need help with your project, uh, go to go to campus tomorrow, at, and I'll be there at two, and I'll stick around for a couple of hours. So I, uh, I'll probably stick around till at least four, and maybe a little bit later if need be. Uh, so, so I do have some stuff with independent study students that I'm doing up in the third floor lab, so I will be doing that. So I won't necessarily be there the whole time, but I'll I'll be in and out and hopefully available. Uh, uh, probably at three though, I'll be tied up. Uh, and then um, maybe I'll be available at 3.30 or so, so we'll see. Okay, um, so to finish the course, make sure you, hopefully you got all your labs done. Tomorrow's the last day to finish labs. And then your, product, your project is due on Thursday, the week after Thanksgiving. So that would be December the 3rd, I believe. That's the last class. And then we'll do the final. I guess we'll do it whenever it's scheduled, unless you want to do it earlier. Or maybe I'll just, I don't know. Maybe I'll make it, a, uh, I don't know, I'll make it available uh, probably earlier, uh, and, then if you, and then if somebody doesn't take it, uh, then they can take it on the actual day it's scheduled. I don't know. Let me know. Yeah, so the people that show up on Monday, and I'll probably try and do, I'll probably try and do the Wednesday next week, uh, also live maybe at 9. Um, and I'll also maybe, uh, if you have, if you have questions, uh, on your project, I'll try and help you some. I'll probably talk for maybe 30 minutes, and then the last 30 minutes, I'll, I'll do a help session for anybody with issues on their project. Um, so I know some people are having trouble. Um, remember, all the, all, the, all the variables that have to connect to anything on the board must be in your top-level modules port list. The only variables that communicate in any way at all with the outside world are the variables in the top-level port list, the top module port list. Your top module is the window to the world. And although other module, other submodules can deal with those variables, but they still have to pass them out through the top module by being instantiated in the top module. And then those, those, those external uh, variables are passed to that submodule inside the top module. And maybe even passed to a sub, to a submodule, and then from the submodule to another submodule. That's all fine. But eventually, they have to find their way back up through all the through all the instantiations to the top level module and the port list. So a submodule can't have a variable in there in its port list that that connects to the outside world directly. It has to go through the port list of the top level module. Um, okay. So let's see. Okay, so let's pop this up. I'll, I'll shrink me down a little bit. Let's see. I'll, I'll shrink me down. And uh, so here's our syllabus. 
Uh, I don't know. There's no reason, not too much reason to even look at it. But so here we are um, on the 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 uh, the twenty. Uh, sorry, that's confusing. Thanksgiving is not the twenty seventh. It's the twenty sixth, right? Oh, I see. The twenty seventh is that Friday, right? Okay, so yeah, there's no class on the twenty seventh because it's a it's it's the university is out then, but Thanksgiving is the twenty sixth. Yeah, I don't know. I'm, for some reason, I'm this the last few weeks of this this all the schedules has gotten me a little confused. Okay, <clears throat> so uh, I I pretty well covered all the uh, all the extra topics. So all we're going to do is review review today. We'll review Monday the thirtieth, and we will review uh, Wednesday the second. And that's it. Last day of class. Projects due the second. Midnight. Upload a video. Uh, let's see. I do think there's a link. Let me let me double check that. Let's let me go on. Uh, so I'll close this. Let's see. And then we'll go through these questions in just a minute. Let me go on Blackboard and make sure that we really do have a link. Because uh, I don't remember now. Let's see. I'm pretty sure we do. But if not, I'll make sure there is one. And maybe I did not do that. Yeah, no, I'm thinking I didn't. Yep, I don't have one done. Okay. All right, I'm going to pause the video and create that right now. Okay, there is a turn in link now. Turn in video of final project. Due midnight, December 2nd. Try and upload it as an MP4 if you can. Or uh, if you uh, don't have any video recording capability, you can do it with Zoom. And uh, and then you can uh, and and then you can save it as an MP4 off of Zoom. Uh, you can even uh, use your cell phone as your camera, and you can log on with your desktop and also with your phone, and then you can let the phone do the video, and actually the audio too, for that matter. Uh, you can mute the audio and close and yeah, mute the audio uh, speaker and microphone on your desktop, and. Uh, and then you can use your cell phone uh, as the primary uh, as the primary camera and also the microphone. And then once it's recorded, you can save it on your desktop. Uh, let your desktop be sort of the, the master controller. So, all right, um, all right, that should be good. I think a lot of students figure out how to do it for the, the for the practicum anyway. So, okay. Um, all right, so let's uh, pop up this, and we'll go through, not this, let's see, pop up uh, this. Yeah, all right, so these are typical of the questions. Uh, I, I will definitely borrow some of these questions. I'll probably modify them a little bit, uh, and, and maybe not all of them, but between all the various uh, finals for all the years, uh, the, the questions are kind of similar. So there'll be questions on, um, let's see, let me pop this over here. There'll be questions on um, language-based hardware design tools, the advantages of them. There'll be uh, some things about uh, the Vivado IDE. Uh, there'll be uh, just some general statements about hardware design, uh, differences between writing uh, good HDL code and C++ code. Um, uh, there'll be some questions just on uh, Verilog HDL, um, and then uh, there may be a little code segment with some questions about that, maybe not, and um, then uh, there may be a couple of hardware type questions. Uh, this is back when we were using the Spartan 3A board, um, and yeah, and then some of these. So we'll just go through all these. All right. So. Very complex designs can be easily done with gate level schematics. Well, that's just not true. Uh, you, you, you know, I, I've already made this point a bunch of times, but um, uh, the, um, for instance, the the latest NVIDIA chip using eight eight nanometer feature size. Um, it has it has two billion transistors on it, and we already did the math. That would take uh, a square mile, 
a square mile to lay out that schematic, assuming uh, a square inch for each transistor, which isn't very much. Uh, and there'd be some resistors and other biasing things maybe thrown in there. Uh, I mean, that's actually, you know, that's fairly small. And it would take a square mile, a piece of paper the size of a square mile, to hold that schematic of two of two or four billion. I forget how many transistors we. I I think maybe we did it for four billion, but still, uh, so half that size, half a mile by square mile. It's still a ridiculously large piece of paper, so large that it's completely untenable. And and how could you walk around on it? How how could you possibly draw? All those transistors. I mean, how long would it take you just to count the four billion? Uh, quite a time. It, I mean, that's four billion seconds. I, I, I really want to impress on you the the size of of the number of transistors in these in these uh, in these devices is just almost beyond comprehension. And there's no possible way, without computer based, language based design tools operating at a fairly high level that you could ever make sense out of one of these designs. It's just that s simple. Uh, and the only way this really works is because we have previously dev uh, developed boards that had, uh, you know, a half a billion, trans 500 million transistors on them. And then before that, boards with 100 million transistors. And before that, boards with 500,000 transistors and so forth. We've worked our way up here. And we're reusing parts of those earlier designs and just expanding bit widths and other things, um, and then adding some adding some new features. And the only way you can do that is with is with a very high, very powerful uh, language based tools that that have very powerful synthesizers built in that can then uh, translate all that into uh, a workable uh, set of uh, of uh, of uh, photo masks and process steps to take to the foundry and execute. That's the only way this can happen. Um, so language-based tools allow for the design to be done at a behavioral level of abstraction. That's right, they do. And and if you can stay at the behavioral level, all the more, all the better. Language-based tools make designs much easier to reuse. Yes, they make them much easier to reuse because you can have debugged, uh, verified, uh, intact modules that you know will go through a synthesizer and create a piece of silicone that will absolutely do exactly what you want it to do. And then all you have to do is marry the inputs and the outputs to other modules. Uh, and as long as you don't mess up those interfaces, it should work out of the box first time. And then, of course, you're going to simulate it to make sure that your interfaces are working correctly for timing and other constraints. Uh, Vivado is a good example of a language-based tool. No, uh, Vivado is an integrated development environment. The language-based tool is, is Verilog. Language-based tools can allow designs to be simulated even before, for, yes, you can have pre- and post-synthesis simulation, and you should. IDEs like Vivado contain the following features. The ability to use modules written in different languages in the same project. Yes, you can actually incorporate IP written in VHDL, along with a uh, primary program written in Verilog and vice versa, and, and, and also other IP written in Verilog. The ability to simulate your system at different levels of abstraction and pre and post synthesis. Yes, it does have that. Automatic debuggers to fix behavioral areas, errors in the code. No, that is a problem. Behavioral errors are your responsibility. Uh, Vivado can help you with syntax. In fact, the, the editor is great for that. It checks your syntax as you type. Vivado can can uh, can flag potential uh, uh, behavioral errors, but but basically, if you put in the wrong logic, uh, Vivado's not going to know that you did that. Um, powerful text editors that check syntax and show keywords automatically. Yes, a synthesizer that can create a bit file to program the FPGA. Yes, that's exactly what Vivado does. It creates bit files. Vivado does not manufacture. Does not make the photo mask and, and foundry steps for producing integrated circuits. Uh, if you want to do that, then you have to get Mentor Graphics, Cadence, uh, Synopsis, one of those. Uh, and they're, they're pricey. Uh, Vivado's free, and the reason it's free is because uh, Xilinx wants you to use it to uh, 
to uh, develop code for their chips and thereby increase sales of their FPGAs. Um, so, and by the way, uh, AMD is apparently uh, going to acquire Vivado in a year. I mean, uh, uh, Xilinx in a year. Pretty crazy. The following are statements about hardware design. Mark ones that are in general true. The reusability of language-based designs has been key in developing very complex ICs. Yes. The HDLs can be used to design both integrated circuits and implementations for FPGAs. Yes. They can do both, but usually they take different... Uh, software tools, obviously. One of the keys uh, for good design is to combine as much detail as possible in the top module. No, that's really a bad strategy. You want your top module to be a streamlined uh, combination of your sub-modules. So you want, you want functionality divided up into sub-modules and, and encapsulated in sub-modules so you can debug them separately, make sure they're working, and then you just instantiate them in the top module. Uh, rather than having a, a straight linear top module that, that does everything. There are several HDLs, including Verilog, VHDL, System, uh, System VHDL, System Verilog, uh, um, System C. Yeah, there are. Verilog is the most used HDL for fabrication in the U.S. and Europe. I think it's most used for fabrication in the U.S. and Europe. It, it may uh, give way to VHDL. I don't know. <coughs> That's probably a moving target. It's a bad question. I probably won't ask that. General differences in writing good HDL code and C++ code are the topic of the next group. Verilog is more permissive than VHDL, especially in always blocks compared to process blocks. Yeah, process blocks can never be used to create combinational logic. But always blocks can. Uh, I don't know whether it's a really great idea or not, but clearly some code is more easily understood if you generate your combinational logic in an always block, even though the real purpose of an always block is for is for process-based statements for for sequential code, uh, where you're where you're controlling it with a clock or you have events or some other way, um, you can write legal HDL code that cannot be synthesized. Yes, that's absolutely correct. Uh, you can write legal HDL code that uh, can't be synthesized. It may be because the technology doesn't exist. Uh, it may be because uh, it's it's just practically like, for instance, you can write uh, you can write HDL code that has a uh, 256 uh, bit AND gate, uh, 256 input AND gate. Well, that can't be synthesized because there's 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 no hardware that can really just do that. What you'll have to do if you do it, uh, say in Vivado, you're going to be cobbling together a whole bunch of uh, lot sixes to make that happen. Um, uh, so you can't just have a single. What about an? Inter can you make an integrated circuit with that? No, you probably cannot because uh, because uh, it it may be just uh, too many inputs, and if you tried to make that gate, it would not work correctly. So you really have to break it down into gates with much fewer inputs and you have to daisy chain a bunch of them together. Um, uh, so, or not daisy chain, but, but stack them actually. Um, the magic in language based hardware design is the text editor. No, it's the synthesizer. The process, uh, the progress in synthesizers has driven most of the advances in language based designs. Yeah. As synthesizers have gotten more and more powerful, you're able to, write your code at higher and higher levels of abstraction and, and get into fewer and fewer details and still have everything work. The progress in, uh, yeah. One great feature is the availability of lots of existing IP that can be imported to a new design. Yes, that is a huge uh, benefit. These days, uh, you know, if you do this, if you if you write this, uh, if you work with, uh, uh, if you do digital design for a living, day in and day out, and you're working with, say, Vivado, you're working with an integrated development environment, be it, be it for an FPGA or be it for making ICs, you're you're gonna you're gonna know about a lot of IP. Some of it your company may already own, and that's great because it's free. Some of it you may have to license or, or buy. That's fine, uh, but you'll probably save yourself uh, it, it, well worth the investment in order to do that. And then there's quite a bit of free IP that's available as well. 
And so, uh, so you're going to you're going to take advantage of that as much as you can, and you're you're going to anything that that any uh, anything that's already been really worked out that's that's available as, as intellectual property. You're gonna you're just going to use that and, rather than try and recreate it. Uh, at least most of the time. Okay. Um, so, uh, following questions refer to very log use in hardware design and what is not synthesizable. Inertial delays cannot be synthesized. That's right, they cannot be. Inertial delays are inherent to the technology you're using, and you can specify whatever you want to your blue in the face. It will have relevance in your test bench and simulations, but it will not uh, control what happens to uh, when the hardware is actually made because when the AND gate's created or maybe the AND gate's already on your FPGA and you're just going to use it um, or are you going to simulate it with a LUT6 the performance of that LUT6 is is already established when that chip was manufactured that you're using and you can specify to your blue in the face but it's not going to change the hardware that's already been made even when you make an integrated circuit from scratch your choices of how that integrated circuit are, are going to be assembled really determine uh, the feature size, the voltage it's running at, uh, a lot of other things, the length of the, uh, the, length of the wires connecting, uh, the metalized paths connecting uh, different gates, all those things are gonna, gonna determine these, these transport and propagation delays. And what you specify in your code is only useful for simulation. So of course you want it to be uh, close to reality, so your simulations will be close to reality. Um, Wait for 100 nanoseconds in always loops can be synthesized. Uh, yeah, in, in certain cases, that's right, it can be. Um, but generally, uh, uh, generally, that's that would generally be used, uh, that would generally be used in your test bench. Um, the display operator is not synthesizable. That's right, it's not. Operators for addition, subtraction, and multiplication can all be synthesized, but not, divi not division. No, actually, uh, a lot of these things can be, uh, can be uh, synthesized. Uh, the, uh, even division uh, specified in a high-level statement can be, uh, can be worked out. Uh, it depends a little bit on your synthesizer, whether that's doable or not. Um, let's see. So let me just let me just talk about this for a minute because this is uh, a little bit of a point of confusion. So first off, addition, subtraction, and multiplication are all directly synthesizable with very few restrictions, um, except uh, generally uh, for multiplication uh, you have to have integers. Uh, division is a, a little bit of a different matter. So for many integrated development environments. Uh, division is not synthesizable. You have to lay out the algorithm for doing it. Now, it can be done. Uh, in some cases, uh, some, uh, some, some synthesizers will handle it if it's uh, division by a power of two, in which case it can use shifting. Uh, so if you're dividing by a power of two, then shifting, uh, uh, then division may actually uh, synthesize just fine. Uh, but if you're doing uh, just g generic numbers, uh, most of the time it will not synthesize. Uh, so, but these others will, uh, if you're using integers for sure. Addition and subtraction are defined on bit vectors. So, uh, but multiplication is not defined on, on bit vectors, only on, only on integers. And again, division, um, in certain cases it is, but mostly in generic sense it is not. Um, but there are there are pieces of code that allow you to get it done. Uh, but you're kind of on your own. Okay, here's the following code segment used for several questions. Okay, so let's look at this. Uh, I don't know if I'm gonna. I, I may give you some figures and have some questions based on them. So so don't assume that won't happen. So module shift register pound parameter width equals eight, and then then we have an open bracket. Reset in, uh, input reset in, input clock, input data ENA, input serial data, output register with minus one to zero. So this is where it's gonna use this parameter width 
defaulting to 8, but when it's instantiated, you can change that width to whatever you want it to be. Okay, and then the close bracket, and that's our port list. Here's our always block. Always at pause edge clock, neg edge reset, not, underscore n. If reset, underscore n, uh, parallel data uh, equals uh, tick 0. Uh, now, how does this work? Well, so remember, when you don't specify the number of bits, then uh, that's where you have to know some of the rules. And it may default to 32 bits in this case. Um, but if, uh, if parallel data is up here, uh, well, I don't even see where it's defined. So, oh yeah, here, parallel data. So it's width minus one to zero. So, uh, so this is, so as long as it doesn't exceed 32 bits, you should be okay there. Uh, but if it exceeds 32, that's going to be a problem because you didn't specify the number of uh, bits. Um, and uh, you, you do have to, so it's just always a little bit dangerous. All right. And then uh, uh, else if uh, data underscore ENA. And then let's see, the data, in, that was the serial data enable. That's the serial data enable. So if the serial data enable, then parallel data is equal to the serial data concatenated with the parallel data with minus one. Uh, to one, so that's where you're you're adding uh, you're concatenating this this serial data to the parallel data uh, width. All right, when you instantiate this module, you could you can specify a different shift register. Yes, you can make it you can make it more bits. This is a shift is this is a shift left shift register. Okay, so let's look. So you're adding the serial data bit. To the high order bit. So you're shifting the parallel data from width minus one down to one. You're throwing away the zero value. So you're right shifting it, not left. If you don't specify a value for width, it will equal 16 bits. No, it defaults to eight in the, uh, in the module definition. If you instantiate this same module twice, could you use a different size for width each time? Yes, you could. Look at these. In, look at this instantiation. Shift register, as defined up here, pound sixteen, sr one, and then your port list reset clock enable data in load and load data. Mark the correct equivalent depiction of the variable parallel data that we be used in this module. Well, obviously, it's it's gonna the the uh, parallel data then down here is defined as uh, uh, where is parallel data defined? Right here. It's going to be width minus 1 to 0. So width is defined as 16 because it's instantiated here. And so that would be 15 to 0. So it's a 16-bit uh, shift register. So it would be register 15 to 0, parallel data. Wire 16 to 0. No, because it's defined as a register. Register eight to zero? No, because it's we specif we instantiated it with uh, uh, a, a width of sixteen, um, and then seven to zero. Nope, the width is sixteen. So the correct answer is register fifteen to zero parallel data. This code segment will be used for several questions. Okay, this one is a little screwy. I'm not even going to go over it. Um, and this one was too. Well, actually, maybe this one's okay. Um, yeah, no, it, it isn't. It, it, this whole question is bad, right? This is all one thing. Yeah, it, it got a little confusing. What I wanted you to pay attention to here was blocking and non-blocking, but it gets a little squirrely. Make sure you understand the difference between blocking and non-blocking in an always block. All right, here's a, here's a question. Answer the questions about the implications of these push buttons to this Spartan FPGA, assuming that the buttons are normally open, momentary closed buttons. There are some things, there are some settings that are required for these buttons to work. Note, assume this FPGA works like the Artrix 7 we used. Okay, so even though it says Spartan 7, assume it's going to work like the Artrix 7. Okay, so uh, first off, this is 3.3 uh, volts, 3V3, that's an abbreviation for 3.3 volts. So that's 
That's our power. That's our, what our chip's more or less running at, although I think the actual FPGA may be running at 1.8 volts. Uh, but you can use that on these inputs. Uh, so um, 36, you would need to set the bank for pins P29 to 33 to the right voltage. Yes. Yeah, you do want to set them for 3.3 volts because if you set them for 1.8 volts, then they might be they might they might be uh, uh, they might be drawing too much current when you uh, push the button. What other internal setting can you imagine might be required? All right. So if this is the whole circuit right here, then notice all all of these pins would be floating when these momentarily closed, normally open buttons are open and not being pushed. This wire comes in and goes nowhere, so it's sitting there floating. And we already know floating inputs to digital devices are always a bad idea. So what could you do? Well, you should know that our, that our FPGA has the ability to turn on pull-ups in our gates, and you should turn on the pull-ups or pull-downs. Uh, actually, in this case, you probably want pull-downs because uh, your, connect, the button is shorting the input to 3.3 volts. So you definitely want pull downs if you're going to have them read zero when they're not pushed and read one when they are pushed. Um, so when the button is not pressed, what should the pin read? Well, you should pull it down to zero. It should read zero. Um, and here, this was for, I guess, 37. What other internal setting? Uh, none, pull ups, pull down. Um, yeah, and the right voltage here is uh, one uh, is 3.3 volts. Yeah. When the button is not pressed, what should it read? It should read uh, zero. When when the circuit was built and SW1 was pushed each time, uh, there was a, a defect on the conveyor belt to mark a defective product. Sometimes several good products were also marked after the bad one as defective. What do you think might be causing this problem? Hint. Remember, is the button is a mechanical device, and the FPGA is very fast. So what I'm alluding to here is the the phenomenon of bouncing. We know that uh, if you have a tech standing there punching buttons, and uh, they see a defective product and they punch the button, it could be it could be read as three inputs or more, whatever, because FPGAs are very fast. Unless you build in some some nice debouncing uh, uh, software or hardware, then you may very well get multiple actu 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 actuations on every button press simply because the button's going to bounce a little bit. And these FPGAs are 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 uh, can be running at 200 megahertz or faster. Um, okay, um, let's see. So bouncing. All right, and 40, when you design with a Xilinx FPGA, what provisions do you need to make on the printed circuit board that will mount the FPGA to allow it to function when you turn it on? Assuming your code is good and all the pins are hooked up correctly and all the clocks and power are set up correctly and the board is made correctly. And the answer is, you have to have some way of flashing the program, or not flashing, but reading the program into the static RAM at power up. Because every time you power up uh, the, one of the Xilinx FPGAs, you have to rewrite the bit file into your static RAM. And that's because it's volatile. When you power down, it goes away. So that's, that's one of the downsides. Of course, there are FPGA companies that have FPGAs that uh, have flash memory instead of static RAM. And there's pros and cons to that. But, uh, but Xilinx has made their bed, and that's where they're going. And they're, 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 all their products are going to require the bit file to be uh, loaded into the, to the FPGA at power up. And uh, there are quite a few features built in to the uh, FPGAs to, to facilitate doing that. Uh, but you have to actually implement it. And you have to have some place where that, FP, where that bit file is being stored so it can, in fact, be, uh, be uh, fed into this chip at power up. You could store it on the same printed circuit board that your chip's mounted on. You could have it connected to a remote server or some other mechanism. Uh, but you you have to at power up you have to you have to put that file in the static RAM. All right. 
um, consider the following. So here's an always block. Uh, so it's triggered by S1, S0, I0, I1, I2. And then there's a case statement, and it's based on S1, S2, S0. Uh, and then you have three cases, uh, two tick uh, decimal zero, two tick decimal one, two tick decimal two. So these are two bit values of zero, one, and two. And if it's zero, then out is equal to I zero. If it's one, out is equal to I one. And if it's two, out is equal to I two. End case. What problem will be encountered with this code that was likely not intended? It'll create a four to one mux. Well, that's what it was looking, that's what they intended, clearly. Will create a combinational circuit. Yes, it, it should be a combinational circuit, except it will create a latch. And the reason it will create a latch is if your S1 and S0 are both one, then there's no relevant case, which means this block has to have a latch that assigns the previously assigned value and holds it so that it can be used in the case that none of these cases are true. And that, that's why you've, 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 by the way this code was done, you force this to create a latch. Uh, and it probably will give you a warning so you know that's what's happening, hopefully. Um, you can change the code and fix the result by including the following line. Uh, 2 tick D3 out equals 0. 2 tick D3 out equals I3. Default out equals 0. Or 3 tick D4 out equals I4. Well, first off, there was no I4, so that one's out. Uh, default is fine. Uh, 2 tick D3 out equals 0, and 2 tick D3 out equals I3. Uh, the only problem with I3 is there's no I3 in the port list, in the always block. So uh, if I3 is undefined, that code's going to generate an error. Uh, would the following line uh, fix the code also? 2 tick D3 out equals 1. Yes, of course it would. If you create a submodule and include it in the same file as the top level module, but it is not instantiated in the top level module, and there are no external port signals in the submodule, how will the synthesizer use this module? Well, it wouldn't be used. It would never be incorporated since it's never instantiated, unless it's instantiated in some other module, submodule. But if it's never instantiated, it won't be used. Look at these lines of code. Answer the question. So tick time scale 1 nanosecond slash 10 picoseconds. All right. And now you have pound 5 A equals B and C equals pound 5 B. What kind of delay does the second line show? Okay, this was confusing because there's line 1, line 2. But really, I intended line 1, line 2. I intended not to count this one. So, so if you take this line, it shows an inertial delay. If you take this line, it shows a propagation delay. So take your pick. Would A and C be updated at the same time if B changes permanently from 0 to 1? So let's say B changes from 0 to 1. Uh, so normally what that would do is in both cases, these are continual assignments, it would drive the updating of A in 5 nanoseconds here, and it would drive, drive the updating of C in 5 nanoseconds there. Well, yeah, so would a and C be updated at the same time if B changes? Yes, permanently, from 0 to 1. Yes, they would be. What would happen to A if the signal B was initially 0 for 700 picoseconds and then back to 0? Initially 0, then 1 for 700 picoseconds and then back to 0. Okay, so, so in A, it's an inertial delay, so it would filter out this, this less than 5 nanosecond pulse. Uh, so, so here's the right answer. Go, go to 1 for 700 picoseconds and back to 0? No. Go to 1 at 5 nanoseconds and stay at 1? No. Stay at 0? Yes. Go to 1 at 5 nanoseconds and back to 0 at 10 nanoseconds? No. It would just, it would never respond to this stimulus at all because it would be filtered out because the inertial delay is greater than the, than the, than the pulse. What would happen to see if the signal B was initially 1, 0, and then 1 for 700 picoseconds, and then back to 0. All right, in this case, it's a transport delay, and it is going to, it is going to uh, work 
but it just has that delay. So it would go to one for 700 picoseconds and then back to zero. Go to one at five nanoseconds, stay at one, stay at zero, go to one at five nanoseconds and back to zero at 10 nanoseconds. So, so yeah, so actually none of these are really, well, this one is, so go to one for 700 picoseconds and back to zero. Yeah, that's what it would do. It, 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 but it would be delayed still by five nanoseconds. So these were all bad answers. Um, so the correct answer was uh, wait for seven, wait for five nanoseconds, then go to one for 700 picoseconds and then back to zero. That's what, that's what would happen. There'd still be that delay, but it would not filter out the pulse. But the pulse would be delayed by five nanoseconds. All right. So there were always, there's always a few bad apples in the bunch. Okay. K. A. I don't know why that's K. A two input AND gate. Uh, and OR gate have our uh, OR gate. Oh, I see. It's K, J, K. Okay, got it. A two input AND gate and OR gate inputs are 1 and X as the two inputs. What is the output of the AND gate? Can't sp uh, it would be X. What is the output of the OR gate? It would be 1. Write the code for a 2 to 1 MUX using a single statement. Okay, uh, so use the inputs I0 and I1 and cell line A. Don't worry about the other code. Just use one line and make I0 selected when A is 0. Okay, so so basically, there's a lot of ways to do that. You can just write the, the equations, which is uh, the, the MUX output. We'll call that F. F equals uh, uh, equals cell prime anded with I0 or cell anded with I1. Um, okay, it's it's actually it's A. So A A prime I0 plus A I1. So that was you could write that. Or you could use the 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 the, the, the question mark colon uh, syntax, which is the essentially it's an it's an or statement, um, an if statement essentially, an if else statement. Uh, but that's legal in your continuous assignments. Whereas an if statement you can't use except in an always block. So uh, and you can't do an always block in a single line. Okay. I think uh, I think that's a good chunk. I think I'm just gonna uh, quit with that. Um, I'll probably send out an email uh, maybe tonight or tomorrow morning and kind of laying out uh, so the last of the last of the course. Remember, get your pro get your all the labs. You must have all the labs except for you can miss one lab and still get a grade. But if you're missing two labs and you don't turn in your lab today by midnight, a video recording of it to Alex or come to lab and demonstrate it at 2 p.m. in the afternoon. We'll be there probably from 2 to 3, 3.30, 4 maybe. So come in and, and do that. Uh, and don't screw that up. Tomorrow, to, well today, Wednesday today, is the last day you can come on campus this semester. Uh, they're going to shut the campus down after tomorrow. I, I don't know even if I can go in, but I hope so because i got stuff in my office I'll need to get probably. Uh, so, uh, so just keep that in mind. This is your last last chance to go into lab, get some help, demonstrate it uh, live to the TA. Same for your project. I'll be there. Uh, like I said, I've got a couple other things going on, but I'll be there. Uh, I'll probably be there from two to four, and I'll be upstairs in the third floor lab a little bit, helping my independent study students. So come in and get your project. Uh, get some help on your project if you need to. If you get it working. Uh, demonstrate it. Make sure uh, Alex gives you credit for it. Or you can demonstrate it to me and I'll tell Alex to put you on the list. Uh, but he's got the official list right now. Or I did create a link on Blackboard and you can upload it to that link. Upload your video to that link. Put your ID card in the video just like you did for the uh, practicum. All right, that should do it. Uh, we will see you then after Thanksgiving or tomorrow uh, or at 2 p.m. in the lab on Wednesday. All right.